This is another iRaw podcast. So it might be that initially, you know, it was a good bargain for them that they were attracted to the urban environment because it was safer, warmer, offer free sources of food and so on and so forth. But at a point when that's combined with habitat destruction and increased reliance on human provision, then they become captive to the extent that their options are severely restricted. Welcome back to The Animal Turn, everyone. This is season three, where we're focusing in on animals and the urban. Now, there have been a couple of really cool developments at The Animal Turn lately. If you haven't checked it out already, please go and have a look at our website, theanimalturnpodcast.com. There's a whole bunch of awesome resources uh, on there. I've tried to include you know, reading and links to other podcasts that are of use to you, particularly in relation to the first two seasons where we looked at animals and the law and animals and experience. And da, 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 we have just launched a blog. Um, so there's going to be more exciting content coming on the website soon. It's a work in progress, but things are getting there and I'm super, super excited. And hopefully... I have a sneaking suspicion that by the time this episode releases, we will be at 5,000 downloads. Da, 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 da. That's really, really exciting. Uh, thank you so much to all of you who listen, who download, uh, who send me emails with feedback. And I was floored when I reached 1,000. Um, and to reach 5,000 just seems unbelievable. So thank you so much for all of your support and for downloading. And uh, I'm going to do that typical podcaster thing and say, if you have it in you to leave a review, please, please, please do so. And if you're looking for a place to leave a review, check out podchaser.com. And the reason I'm highlighting Podchaser, and they haven't asked me to do this, but the reason I'm highlighting Podchaser is that at the moment, any review you leave will also give money towards Meals and Wheels. And uh, another really cool thing about Podchaser is you can leave a review for a very specific episode or for an entire podcast. So uh, go check that out. There's loads of really cool content there. Uh, so if listening is your gig, which obviously it is, then please go check out Podchaser. I've been putting together some listening lists there as well. So if you find me, Claudia Hertenfelder, you might get some extra bits and bobs there too. But... That's not why you're here. Enough with the admin, Claudia. Enough with the admin. In today's episode, I speak to Nicola Delon about the concept of pervasive captivity. Now, pervasive captivity is a concept I'd never come across before. To be honest, I'd actually given very little thought to even the idea of captivity. What does it mean to be a captive? And what you're going to see throughout this episode is that Nick has a much broader definition of what captivity entails and in fact he actually thinks that there are many ways in which animals in the urban are captive so this episode and this concept i think are quite valuable and useful and you'll hear throughout the episode that while i'm speaking to nick my mind is kind of expanding as we talk i, I didn't didn't know this concept obviously I prepared a bit for the the interview itself but as we were talking just the the fruitfulness and the usefulness of this concept and understanding uh, human and animal relations in the urban just became more and more pronounced so I think you're going to find it useful too at least I hope so uh, just a little bit about our guest today so uh, Nicola Delon is an assistant professor of philosophy and environmental studies at the new college of Florida he specializes in animal ethics with a particular interest in moral status and animal agency. He has published in these topics, but he's also published a fair bit on the ethics of killing animals, uh, urban animals, as well as wild animals suffering. All right. Hi, Nick. Welcome to the Animal Turn. Oh, thanks for having me. Is it okay that I call you Nick? I've just met you and I'm like, hey, Nick, or should I be saying Nicholas? Yes. What? Uh, it's perfect. The way you would say it in French is Nicolas, but it's really hard not to have people butcher it. Uh, so Nick is how I go in the US at least. Nic so, Nicolas? Yeah. Nicolas. Nicolas, yes. Yeah. I am, I'm terrible at pronouncing things in English, which is my home language. So I suspect that I would just be absolutely abysmal in pronouncing anything in, in French. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you for, for letting me say Nick. Uh, it's great to have you on the show and to see you. Um, I'm really 
uh, thrilled that we managed to connect with one another on Twitter and to speak about what's a really interesting concept. Um, I always love having philosophers on the show. I find that uh, philosophers have a way of thinking about the world in a very different way, but in, in a way that's somehow both obvious. You're like, oh, yes, of course, that's the way it works, but mm-hmm, somehow mm-hmm. Um, really complex at the same time. So uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today. Could you maybe, uh, I, I like to start each episode off trying to get a sense of who the interviewee is. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and how you, how you came to study what it is you're studying? What are you studying? What is what is your area of interest? Great. So I teach philosophy and environmental studies at a small liberal arts college in, in, in Florida, in the U.S. I'm a philosopher by training, and I came to the U.S. Uh, almost seven years ago now, thanks to a great opportunity to do a postdoc for three years at uh, New York University in the Animal Studies Initiative. So that was back in 2014, and I think that's the date when I started considering myself as someone who does animal studies, simply because it was part of the job description for me. Um, Until then, I was doing my PhD in France, back in Paris, on animal ethics. So animal ethics is my area of specialization. so until 2014, from basically uh, 2010 to 2014, I was considering myself mostly as an animal ethicist. And then when I was brought to the U.S. for the postdoc, I started doing work that was more um, heavily interdisciplinary and getting in touch with more people outside of my discipline. So mm-hmm. perhaps that's when I started doing animal studies, more broadly speaking, even though I still consider myself an animal ethicist and, and, and a philosopher. Um so that's the academic background, relatively standard philosophical education in France. Um, and I started developing a sort of a sort of interest for animals in 2008, I think. Um, and the backstory is that I had been a vegetarian for a number of years when I was a teenager, on and off. And um, I was not a vegetarian at the time when I picked up on that interest. Um, and so things shifted sort of back and forth between the academic interest and the personal interest. And at some point in the early 2010s, um, I sort of converged both in terms of theory and practice uh, on what I wanted to study. So the moral status of animals, uh, the ethics of how we should treat them. Um, and so uh, those various things starting started, you know, sort of uh, consolidating uh, around that time. Uh, which means I've been doing that for about uh, 10 years now, more than that, 12 years, actually. It's amazing how time just kind of adds up, right? You, you start with yeah. one thing and you're like, oh, I'm just doing my PhD. <laughs> and 10 years later, you, you're like, oh, it's part of who I am and how I eat and how I see the world. Um, and it really, a lot of guests have kind of spoken about this dual, this I guess dual becoming. I, I'm reading, maybe I'm reading too much philosophy these days myself. But um this kind of in your personal life, there seems to be a lot of people that are dealing with some of the relationships that we have with animals in our personal lives, and at the same time asking these complex questions in in academia, and these kind of coalesce and shape one another. It's really difficult to kind of tear them apart. I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, especially in this topic, uh, you know, it gets really personal really quickly, mm-hmm. um, and I think there there are many topics in philosophy where what you study and even what you preach doesn't necessarily have a straightforward connection to how you act in your mm-hmm. ordinary life. But when it comes to the ethics of eating animals or keeping them captive, well, obviously there's going to be some practical implications. So it's, yeah. it might be one of the fields in philosophy where you see more direct connections, even though there have been studies and it's not entirely clear that philosophers are better than others at, at practicing what they preach, but, but that's what you would expect at least. Yeah. I, I mean, I think part of the the project is just at least thinking about these things deeply. And then at some point, there is also kind of this internal, I guess, contention where to what extent you live in line with what it is you're saying or doing. And I think everybody um, kind of grapples with that. You'll have climate change scientists that are still eating beef burgers and you're kind of like, come on, um, beef, how are you eating beef? Um, So it's, it's always... Yeah, it's 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 always interesting to kind of think about how academia and personal lives coalesce. You mentioned there uh, about captive animals being something that you've been interested in with regards to ethics and animal ethics. And that's what we're going to talk a bit about today is uh, you released a paper where you were talking about a concept called 
pervasive captivity and and in particular in relation to the urban environment. Now, before we get into what captivity is and what pervasive captivity is, maybe we could start a bit broader and say, why do you think we should be talking about urban animals in particular? So you mentioned the animals we eat, and and we've spoken a fair bit about animals we eat on on the show, but why should we be talking about urban animals? What what do we mean when we say urban animals? Great. Um, And it's nice to step back because my interest in urban animals as being captives is something that's not necessarily flowing naturally from my prior interest in urban animals. And those two things could be uh, talked about quite separately. So I think the interest started arising when I was teaching at NYU. So I got lucky to be able to teach basically uh, what I wanted when I was there as part of the animal studies program. And um, at the time, Laurie Grun had just released a volume on the ethics of captivity so I bought it and I thought, wow, that would be a cool topic to be teaching about. And so I created that class called Keeping Animals, where we read a number of chapters from the book and other um, pieces from the, uh, the literature in animal studies, um, talking about the various types of captivity and the ethics of it. Um, and so I did that, that class for three years. So I had time to think long and hard about those issues but I was the the thing that kept uh, being the most interesting to me was not even though that was interesting too, but was not you know, animals in zoos or circuses or companion animals, all the ways in which we keep uh, other animals captive or interact with them. But those animals that seem to be in those liminal spaces where they're neither domesticated nor wild. So I started being interested in urban animals, and I started being interested in them independently of my interest in captivity. So I started thinking more and reading more about them and how they were a sort of unique category that's neither reducible to domesticated or nor to um, to wild animals. And I thought in line with uh, people like Sue Donaldson and, and Will Kimlicka that they raised uh, distinctive types of questions. Um, I guess the other perhaps personal reason why I was interested in them is that was it, uh, living at, I was living in New York at the time in Manhattan. Um, before that, I was living in Paris. Um, and it's always struck me that people who um, live in cities, but also perhaps especially people who don't live in cities, tend to consider the city as a place where animals are out of place or not welcome, or to think of cities as places where you're less likely to see wildlife. And that struck me as false, right? That was not my experience. Um, and I guess perhaps New York was even more a striking case than than Paris, but and pe- you know people don't necessarily know that, but but Manhattan in particular is a migration spot for dozens of species of birds, um, and so you combine that the migratory route with uh, Central Park and the fact that there's tons of free food for urban animals in, in New York, and you get a ton of wildlife, much more than you would expect. Uh, based on your stereotypes of what a large uh, city like Manhattan um, or New York in general are. And so I started noticing them more and more. Um, and because I was interested in them and trying to uh, do something that that was meaningful, I also started volunteering for a, a little bit uh, at the Wild Bird Sanctuary. So um, Uptown in Manhattan, they have a wonderful sanctuary where they basically rescue mostly birds, but also some kinds of uh, of wildlife. Um, uh, the large majority of, of residents are pigeons. And so I learned how to take uh, care of those pigeons, how to feed them, how to clean them, um, how to clean their cages. There's a lot of cleaning, uh, especially cleaning poop, but but that's that you know that's part of, of taking care of them. Um, and so what was re- really meaningful to me is to get on a one-on-one basis caring for those animals that are neglected in real life by most people, but also neglected in the literature. And 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 I found no good reason to uh, dismiss them as less important than the charismatic wildlife that we care about as the genuinely li- white wildlife or... Uh, the domesticated animals, whether they are our companions or whether they are farm animals that we care about because they're um, living lives of, of, of suffering. Um, so, so that's how the both academic and, and personal interest uh, arose uh, a few years ago. And then uh, 
because I was teaching about captivity, I started thinking there were interesting connections, but but mm. I guess we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, so so you think the urban is, um, I mean, you think animals that are in the urban or urban animals are significant because they are urban animals. And we tend to just focus on a, a handful of very uh, charismatic and important species, uh, chimps, uh, elephants. I mean, these are important animals that deserve considered attention, but that there are a lot of animals Maybe because they're just so obvious, so much part of our everyday lives, they become uh, invisible or, or not really seen as important, uh, right. I suppose. Yeah. So yeah. is that why so they became? That, yeah. So there's that definitely uh, sort of a, you know, a willingness to stand up for those who are neglected. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I think they're an interesting testament to the way nature is socialized. Um, and but also the way the social environment, especially the urban environment, is also filled with nature. Mm -hmm. So these animals, pigeons especially, are sort of destabilizing the dualisms we have and the dichotomies we have between the social and the natural, or the rural and the urban, uh, or the domesticated and the wild. Um, and so my colleague at the time, sociologist uh, Colin Gerald Mack, uh, has this wonderful book called The Global Pigeon. And he's been one who taught me how to, you know, more systematically question those boundaries between the social and the natural and how they interact. Um, and, and, and by looking at the wildlife in the urban environment, I, I, I realized that those animals were not just neglected, but really, really interesting in the mm -hmm. ways they led us to question those, those, those categories that we, we live by. Is this Jeremiah who also wrote, he wrote How Pigeons Became Rats? Um, yes, think, yes, yeah, yes, um, yes. Really just a, an interesting paper kind of unpacking the problematization of animals, how animals become problems. And uh, that seems to be quite a, an, an urban phenomenon somehow, like they mm -hmm. become problems in a very distinct way in terms of how they interact with humans. Uh, okay, so I agree with you. you uh, animals are really uh, important. Uh, urban animals are important because they're there and they deserve attention, but they're also interesting as scholars to consider because they kind of challenge all of these different binaries and dichotomies we've created about where different beings belong or should or should not be. So you've mentioned now that a couple of times that you're interested in captivity and you said kind of that, yes, there are animals in zoos and in people's homes, but there are other kinds of captive animals. So perhaps we could talk a little bit now about what is this concept of captivity? What 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 is what does it mean to be captive, and and how does it relate to the city? So the basic and I guess most intuitive definition of captivity, uh, which I don't reject, but I'll, I'll get into more uh, you know fine grained distinctions later, is a depri deprivation of freedom. Right. So being captive is a sort of negative state or a condition for those who are born in it. Um. So when you're captive, there's something you're being deprived of, and that's going to be the freedom to do some things or experience some things uh, or follow certain things like your natural instincts or natural behaviors or live according to um, your natural behaviors and natural needs. Um, so that's that's the sort of starting point of a, of a negative definition of, of, of captivity. Um, but that's not going to be exactly sufficient to recognize and get a really, uh, I think, meaningful account of captivity, because we also need to know how that takes place, right? How, how mm -hmm. we actually deprive um, animals or other beings, um, including human beings, of, of their freedom or freedoms. So following Laurie Grun, I get to a relational account of, of captivity that involves a captive and a captor or you know captives and captors and the captors could be like a collective or it could be an institution it doesn't really matter for for now um so a captive is held captive by a captor and a captor keeps the captive captive by doing certain things and so what they do is they typically confine um the captive being they control the captive being, and oftentimes, as a result of those two things, confinement and control, they also make it make the being dependent. 
So those three conditions are the three conditions that, that Laura Grun lists in her account of captivity. So confinement, control, independence, and they're te- they tend to be mutually reinforcing, right? Um, so we'll get there, but in the case of many urban animals, you can see how by making them dependent and or vulnerable, we also, to a degree, already make them confined to certain spaces where they can survive as opposed to places where they can survive. Um, so those three things tend to be um, interdependent, but so together uh, they constitute uh, the necessary and jointly um, sufficient conditions for, for being a captive. Um, and so when you start thinking about those three conditions, confinement, control, and independence, um, you start realizing that perhaps there are more uh, cases of captivity than you would have suspected. Um, so to give you a provocative example, one objection I've had any time I've presented the paper is that on this account, children are captive. Um, and so <laughs> Laurie Grun in, in the textbook Ethics and Animals uh, in 2010, when she starts giving her account, actually specifies that she doesn't really want children to count as captive. So she adds a clause to the effect that we're only talking about normally functioning adults or something like that. Um, but you know, I don't think that's necessarily uh, an implication we have to avoid. So I'm, you know, I don't always want to bite the bullet, as the philosophers say, but I think that's a bullet I'm willing to bite. I've, and I actually think it raises interesting questions to think of children as captives. Um, so I don't think that's necessarily an objection to the account. I think the account has lots of virtues and we should uh, use that account for these virtues. And if one of the costs is that children count as captive, I think that's a cost I'm willing to to take on. Um, yeah. Okay. So a captive, you, you mentioned earlier, and whether we're including children or not, a captive is in general someone who has their freedoms limited to some extent. They can't just do whatever they want to do. But isn't that true for all of us? Uh, are we yeah. not? And maybe we're getting now into you know the thickets of what is and is not freedom. But to what extent are any of us really free to do whatever we want? Are we are we not all captive to something? Great. So um, I could simply tell you that that's another bullet I'm willing to bite and say yes, we're all captive to uh, our own nature, to the state, to the police, uh, to the military industrial complex, there's all sorts of institutions that actually contribute to restricting our freedoms. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that they do, they make us captive to a degree. Now, I think that if the account led to the conclusion that we're all captive all the time, it would not be doing any any, any interesting work, right? So you you need to be able to demarcate between cases of captivity and cases of freedom. And insofar as we consider ourselves free in our normal lives, um, we want to be able to make those distinctions. So one way to avoid that implication is to consider the deprivation of freedom as an abnormal or really significant deprivation of freedom or restriction. And the restriction that's relevant, I think, is the restriction of options. So Mm -hmm. when the options you have for the sort of things you might want to do are severely limited to the extent that the range of things you can do is much, much smaller than the the range of things you might reasonably want to do, then the restriction counts as abnormal. So... There has to be a sort sort of some sort of comparison between what you could reasonably expect to be able to do if you want to do it in the sort of normal human setting mm-hmm. or in a sort of normal setting for a, a, a species. Um, so you compare that baseline to the actual state or condition of, of the captive. And if their range of options appears to be severely limited, then that's a significant deprivation of freedom that counts as captivity. Okay, so I've, I've got two two follow-up questions there. So I, I understand the, the limits in freedoms, right? And I think if we were to think of urban dogs, we could certainly, this, this came up in the first episode with Marie, where we could think of, let's say you've got stray dogs who roam the streets and have a variety of options available to them uh, in terms of where they want to sleep, what they want to eat. Uh, there might be limits on those options based on other dogs and, you know, kind of territory um, and, and ideas of where they should and should not be in the city versus, let's say, a dog that's in a home um, and they want to eat, but they can't because it's not dinner time yet, or they want to go outside, but they can't because it's not time to go on your walk yet. So the extent to which they can choose 
when to do what they want to do is severely limited in comparison to uh, a street dog. But maybe a, a street dog, um, you know, what they get to eat is maybe different, but they get to choose at least when to eat and when to go on a walk. So I guess which options we're talking about become complicated. So there's that component. But then another thing, I guess the where, where I get a bit like icky a little, is you say the word natural and uh, species specific. But to what extent is that like, predeterministic of what animals would achieve. So let's say you're born into a particular environment um, and you end up becoming a dog that lives with a family that travels the world and you go on multi, like many, many hikes and you may be not doing what would be considered species specific, but you're living a full and rich life, even though you don't get to choose when you eat or when you go on a walk. Um, I don't know if that makes any, any sense. It to does. You. Uh, how do you how do you kind of navigate that that tension of animals being kind of essentialized to natural biological things uh, versus being um, dynamic beings that re- react to their environments? Great, great. No, these are two great questions. So I'll I'll take the second one first. Um, so I don't want to place too much stock on the concept of natural here. I think it's not doing the work that that. Uh, an essentialist conception of nature would do. Um, and like you, I'm sort of wary of introducing too much essence in the way we conceive of species typical or species characteristic behaviors and needs. Um, so I'm working with a really thin notion of natural where what would count as natural for a given species or even for a given population would be some sort of baseline or standard prior to a major shift or major change. So if you can observe a population over a sufficiently long range of time in their habitat, and let's not call it natural habitat for now, but just in their habitat, and then urban sprawl destroys your habitat and builds hundreds of new condos and highways, you disturb their habitat. And I think it makes sense to compare the baseline prior to that event of urbanization to the current condition of the population. It might be a population of coyotes. It might be a population of raccoons, of birds. It doesn't really matter. Um, So what I would count as natural on, on that view would simply be the relatively undisturbed kind of behavior that they could afford before we messed up with their habitat basically. Um, And I think that's compatible with the view that many of those species are actually extremely adaptable and dynamic, Mm -hmm. and that at some point they've adapted to the disturbances such that what would count as quote-unquote natural can now serve as the baseline. Yeah. So I think that's actually interestingly true of some urban animals that are pretty successful, or at least some subpopulations of those animals that are successful in cities, including coyotes and raccoons, which are, especially raccoons, generalist and quite opportunistic. So they adapt relatively well to a range of conditions. And you can already see, it's pretty striking, that there is some form of natural selection going on uh, across different populations of raccoons, where the raccoons that live in urban environments have already different cognitive skills that they haven't learned, perhaps even but that they have uh, inherited from their parents uh, than their counterparts in more rural environments, right? So we can see evolution wow. basically working at the scale of a few generations, which is pretty striking. What, what kind of, uh, uh, what kind of, sorry, that's really interesting. Yeah. What kind of, uh, what, what are we talking about here? What kind of evolutionary? So they, they, are, they, they seem to be, you know, better and or at least uh, quicker problem solvers for the sort of problems that you would find or typical uh of the problems you would find in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and um, so they appear to be, for instance, better at finding or and adapting to a wider range of food options than their rural counterparts. So they are less limited in how they can uh, get by on the food they find than their rural counterparts might, for instance. Um, so they're basically developing a skill of flexibility that they perhaps already had 
but that was not ex exactly expressed until they found themselves in that environment. Okay. So it's not entirely clear that there is a like genetic difference between the raccoons uh, in 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 the country and the raccoons in the city, but mm -hmm. but. They might be actually both inherently resilient, but their resilience expresses itself differently when they are um, in the city. But basically, they, they, the, the raccoons in the city look like they're smarter because they're better problem solvers than the ones you would find in the wild. That's a difference of degree because I think the raccoons in the wild are still incredibly smart. But, mm -hmm. but, but that's well, they have different problems they need to respond to, right? I suppose that's the... like opening the trash can, for instance, yeah. and finding new ways of opening the trash can. So if a raccoon is the has grown in the city or was born to uh, a mom who was uh, who grew up in the city, they will open up the trash can faster than their rural counterparts if they're mm -hmm. faced with the same kind of problem, for instance. That's fascinating. So, okay. So coming back to the concept of pervasive, uh, pervasive captivity. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Can I just... Um, uh, jump back on the question about the stray dogs and just oh yes, of course. Sorry, I yes, interrupted you. There. Confirm that actually, I think there there's a lot to what you were you were saying, and that with a few caveats. The caveat being that if we can find colonies of stray dogs who appear to be flourishing and meeting their basic needs, I'm totally on board to call them more free than the dogs in the home. Home. Mm -hmm. um, I think both might be captive, but for different reasons, right? And so, or captive to different degrees or in different ways. Um, but um, but it might be that for some species that are what Alex Horowitz called constitutionally captive. So there's no way for a companion dog not to be captive, right? To be a companion dog means to be captive in home. Um, and perhaps that's fine because that's the best way for them to survive. But if you can find them, find for them ways to leave their captivity in more free ways mm -hmm. by giving them more opportunities for free play, free roaming, interacting with their conspecifics on their on their own terms and so on and so forth, that that would count as a form of captivity that's less stringent than a typical captivity of a companion dog, especially in a city. Yeah, it's it's a really, I feel like this example is going to cut to the heart of many people. Like it's um, not the heart of problem, but the heart of people because we 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 love our dogs in our homes right many people conceive of them as family members they're uh, they're intimate members of a household but if you are then given an option to imagine your dog living a life where they have what could arguably be more freedom um you know just like you said a colony of dogs that have a social relationship with other dogs that choose their friends and enemies in a more Mm -hmm. um complex way uh you know if there is a way for that to happen how many of us would still want to keep our dogs at home and if we have that in inclination to keep them even if there was a more free uh, potentially more enriching life for them outside of our homes then um yeah what kind of scales of captivity are we talking about there you mentioned at the beginning captor you know captor and a, a captive um and that's a, an interesting thought experiment. Of course, many other people would then maybe contend that there are other things, you know, dogs on the streets are not as healthy. They they don't have as much access to health care. They, they're maybe more likely to die young or, uh, and, and I think, yeah, then you start to open up all these really tough but interesting questions about what is a good life for a dog. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe some dogs are a good life is in a domestic home, how do they get to choose, I guess? That's where, and there are some urban environments where maybe dogs do get to choose. They come back to the same household again and again at the end of the day. Um, and I mean, I, I remember I was in Accra a few years ago and there were goats in the city, a lot of goats, and you see them all around the city. They're, they're going about their business. You see them crossing the streets and they're eating and they're doing all sorts of things. Um, and I remember speaking to a gent because they they eat the goats. And I was like, well, surely they don't come back to you at the end of the day. And like, no, they all, when dusk comes, the, all the goats, they, they've they done their business in the city and they all go back to different human homes, um, uh -huh. which is just a, a fascinating idea to think that maybe there is some sort of like hybrid world out there where dogs would want to come back. Linus would still want to come home and hang out with me in my house. But during the day, <laughs> he would like to be able to leave and do his own thing. Um, right. Yeah. That's actually what I saw when I was in Delhi a few years ago. That's what I saw with dogs. So they don't live in the home, but most of the dogs are what we would consider stray dogs in the West. Um, 
but apparently each dog has their own family that wow. actually monitors them in a way, takes care of them, makes sure they're, makes, makes sure they're fed, and, and so on and so forth. So they live on their own terms. They appear to be totally free of human interference if you accept the you know, uh, uh, car accidents and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But people just like leave them, mind their own business. Um, and, 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 but, but the dogs apparently know which human beings are uh, uh, caring for them. Um, so, so that's a real interesting way, but it seems like that's, that's not something we would even Consider. dreaming of seeing yeah, mm -hmm. in, 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 in most, uh, Western, uh, cities. I mean, cause the implication there is, you know, one is where dogs have been kept here. We're, you're here, whether we like each other or not, you're here. Um, whereas the other today, the dog might choose you and tomorrow the dog might not come back and, right. To some extent, the dog has had an option. Like you mentioned children being captives earlier. <laughs> Maybe to some extent until we're 18, we are captive in that this is the home we go to and where we're fed. And if you're under my roof, this is what you do. But as adults, you're maybe you don't have to necessarily like your parents. You don't have to necessarily mm -hmm. even get along. Um, mm -hmm. So the extent to which you're given some autonomy, whereas most dogs live their whole lives under the care at dogs and cats under the care of a specific human um, or household. Really fascinating. So we're, we're marching on with time. And I think, uh, yeah, this is just opening up so many like things in my brain. <laughs> um, but you spoke about captive in, you're speaking about the word captive in a number of interesting ways here. So yes, I think most people would accept if you see a giraffe in the Brooklyn Zoo, that giraffe is a captive. That giraffe is kept in a really confined space, can't move in the ways the giraffe would normally move. Even how we're speaking about dogs here, maybe some people would say, okay, yes, a dog is a captive in my home. But even when you were speaking about the stray dogs, or we're speaking mm -hmm. about goats that have some freedom to roam the city, you still think that even those animals are captive in the urban environment. Mm -hmm. Is is that correct? Yeah. So so the, the the idea of pervasive captivity is meant to capture the fact that there are many many more captives than we tend to think intuitively, mm -hmm. um, and that's that follows, I argue from the account I gave you earlier, uh, combining uh, confinement control and, and dependence. So if you think um, of the urban environment as creating a lot of spatial constraints on the movements of uh, many urban populations, um, but also enforcing many forms of control through uh, animal control and other forms um, of institutions um, and uh, human behavior, um, and you add to that the fact that because, in a way, the city is such an attractive environment for many of them, over time, many of these animals become dependent. Mm -hmm. At some point, you're going to find a number of cases of animals that are neither fully wild nor fully domesticated that fulfill each of those three conditions, right? And so on my account, they count um, as captive. And that's true even if nobody in particular ever intended to hold them captive, right? So it's not something we intentionally do, right? The results from intentional behavior, like expanding the urban environment, for instance, or destroying habitat, or controlling populations of coyotes, and so on and so forth. Um, so it, fo it follows from intentional behavior, but nobody in particular even ever intended to create the conditions of captivity mm -hmm. of pigeons and raccoons and, and mountain lions and coyotes and ducks and so on and so forth. Um, so, so I think it's an interesting case are, of, yeah, go ahead. No, so as I was just going to say, so these are animals that are now dependent on the environment in which they find themselves. They are reliant on the urban space and existing in another environment is actually not an option. The urban environment is it. Even if there's not a captor in the, the sense of like a human being like you are mine, um, they are as urban animals conceivably dependent on the environment and the resources that are available in that environment, whether that environment is waste, whether that environment is um, skyscrapers acting as cliff faces, whatever it is, they've become dependent on that spatially. Correct. Yes. Okay. And those, those, there are two aspects that are mutually reinforcing. I mean, the fact that we, their options are within the CT boundaries now, but also because of habitat fermentation and destruction, we've 
deprive them of the options they might have had outside of the cities, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and the more that's the case, the more dependent they will become on the few resources they actually have in the city. So it might be that initially, you know, it was a good bargain for them that they were attracted to the urban environment because it was safer, warmer, offer free sources of food and so on and so forth. But at a point when that's combined with habitat destruction and increased reliance on human provision, then they become captive to the extent that their options are severely restricted. Mm. So that account doesn't mean that necessarily any time an urban animal enters the urban environment, they are going to be captive, right? It might be that some populations are actually becoming more free because they have more options in the city. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to argue that necessarily the city is going to be bad for all animals in so far as it's going, to, it's going to be making them captive, right? There, there could be many animals that actually flourish and thrive in the urban environments and become more free by entering those environments. But there are many of them for, for whom that's not the case. So maybe we could unpack an example here that would make it uh, a little bit more accessible. Um, and as you were speaking, something that came to mind for me is, I don't know if it's across Ontario, but recently there was like a salmonella outbreak in bird feeders. Um, and a whole mm-hmm. bunch of birds were dying because the feeders themselves hadn't been cleaned and um, they were dying of salmonella. Uh, and coupled with that, there's been recently kind of a call f- to put up more food for birds because it turns out that a whole lot of birds are dying. And when you do autopsies on them, they're not dying of natural causes, in quotes, but they're dying because they're emaciated, they're starving. So now people are being compelled to put up more food, whereas kind of... I don't know, the the birds are kind of straddle. We've kind of always been taught to not feed wildlife, don't feed wildlife. Right. Birds have kind of become animals that we've often fed in urban environments and have maybe now become reliant on those food supplies. So if all of a sudden we withdraw that food, they could die. Is that, a, is that an example? That's actually an example that's in one of the papers on the topic. So... Um... Uh, making your paper? <laughs> yes, making mallard ducks. Uh, I I took it from Claire Palmer, but the example is of mallard ducks that become uh, increasingly reliant over seasons and seasons of on um, bird feeders, um, mm-hmm. and sometimes human beings willingly throwing bread or other uh, types of food at them, um, to the point when they trade off that reliance on human beings for the ability they might have had to find sources of food on their own. Mm -hmm. And so when the winter comes, if for any reason human beings um, uh, take away uh, the the bird feeders, because you have a population that's more strictly reliant on the the bird feeder, they can become extremely vulnerable to those behaviors or withdrawal, the sort of withdrawal of care that we that we um, enact. Um, so we should be, you know, not just noticing the ways in which we make them dependent, but being mindful of the consequences of making those animals dependent, because as we make them dependent, again, we restrict their options. And we'll, so we might be making them captive, which might be a concern on its own. But even if it didn't lead to captivity, it still leads to increased vulnerability to the mm-hmm. extent that because they are more reliant on us, uh, we have incur- incurred responsibility towards them. Right? So the same is true of many populations of pigeons. For, for General Mack, for instance, talks about the pigeons in Trafal- Trafalgar Square in London or uh, Piazza San Marco in, in Venice, uh, both places where the feeding of the pigeons was more or less institutionalized and really commercialized. But at some point, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, both uh, municipalities uh, decided to ban the feeding of the pigeons. But the pigeons had already become dependent on human provision. Yeah. So they were turned into more vulnerable beings by that decision or by the combination of the decision to feed them and then to stop feeding them. And I, I mean, I suppose there are implications either which way it goes. So there might be a place in which there is no feeding of animals, but where some of the the pressures that you were speaking about earlier with, uh, you know, habitat loss, et cetera, compel humans to say, okay, but I care about these animals, so I want to feed them so that they are okay. Um, but then this starts to raise questions of responsibility when we are, the, the extent and the speed with which we change our mind can't just be something that, you know, a new administration comes in and says, oh, well, this is just something we're going to change. Um, the, the 
the ethics, I guess, involved in this are quite profound in terms of how animals get to experience the urban space and what responsibilities distinctive cities have to those populations, right? So the pigeons in Trafalgar Square uh, have perhaps a very different relationship to maybe the pigeons that I have here in Kingston. There's a population of them that hang out near the supermarket. Um, so I guess your idea of pervasive captivity also then compels urban planners and and city officials to then say, okay, well, what is your responsibility to these animals that are now dependent on you or that you could make dependent? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it it, it meshes well with uh, the idea that captivity is a relational uh, concept, right? Because mm-hmm. it's a relationship between the captor and the captive. It's easy to, in that framework, to conceive of the various negative and positive relation and responsibilities that that would would follow from 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 that kind of relationship um and i you know as laurie grun um likes to say in her work on entangled empathy those relationships are a given they already exist right so it's not like we have a choice to create or not create those relationships those relationships already exist and so the question is not whether or not we should have those relationships but insofar as we do have them how can we improve them Right. Yeah. Um, and so it might be that for many of those populations, there is no longer an option for the an option for them to become free again, whatever that might mean. But there might be many ways of increasing their options such that there could be more free within the confines of of that form of relationship. And I think if, that's why I think uh, not necessarily refusing the implication that children might be captive is important. In that, if you actually recognize that children are captive, then you realize that you have more responsibilities to them than you might have thought. Because mm-hmm. you have created the conditions of their captivity, you also have responsibilities um, with respect to making them more free and autonomous within the confines of, of, of that, that, that setting. Um, and I think there's something analogous uh, going on in the case of, of animals. Um, where in a way it's even worse in that they're not children. Right? They're 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 grown ups. Uh, they're more autonomous than children actually are. They mm-hmm. have more agency, and so they should be able to settle matters of their own on their own terms, even more than children should. I think that's that's profound, and I, I really, I really like the use of pervasive captivity, and that you're not defining it according to like a species type or species categorization. Right? You're not speaking here about food animals or pests or um, you know liminal animals, and these are all useful, I, I guess categories of trying to help us understand some of the different relationships, but instead you're using the relationality at the forefront itself, right? The idea of, of captivity is the is is what you're not even saying captive, right? Like we're speaking about captive and captor, but there are many ways in which a variety of different animals and animal populations could become captive or, or, or engage in relations of captivity. And I, and I really appreciate kind of the idea of the spectrum. Um, it's not a, it's not as totalizing as saying you are a pest. It's, it's, yeah. it kind of, um, it allows for a deeper consideration of a variety of animals, which is really profound. Exactly. And yeah, I think the notion of spectrum is really important here. There, there's going to be a wide range of cases and different degrees of captivity along that spectrum. And that's a spectrum that's going to be intersecting with other spectra. And so that's like that captivity or freedom or just like one dimension Mm -hmm. of a life, including of a good life. And sometimes it has to be traded off against others. When, when, when we think about dogs, for instance, sometimes we'll trade part of their freedom for more safety, uh, um, and that's, you know, these are trade-offs we have to make with human beings. These are trade-offs we have to make with other animals. And so just from the fact that some urban animals might be to some degree or in some way captive, it doesn't necessarily follow that that's going to be a bad thing yes. overall, right? Amazing. Um, all right, we're, we're at 45 minutes. So I am, I know that you've got a quote ready for us. So um, yes. I'm curious to hear it. So... Um, Actually, there was a teaser earlier, so it's going to be from Colin Gerald Mack. So your audience may not be able to see it, but that's that's the book I was talking the about, pigeon. the Global Pigeon. Strongly recommended, uh, University of Chicago Press, and so uh, that's going to be about the pigeons and how um, they are considered, um, at least descriptively. That's a descriptive statement. Considered out of place. Um, uh, All right, so there's going to be a a gap between two parts of the quotation. Is that 
Is that okay? Of course, of course. Like weeds in the cracks of pavement, pigeons represent chaotic, untamed nature in spaces designated for humans. Pigeons have become particularly despised urban trespassers, partly because they, in all their animality, are so public. It is almost as if they taunt us with their seeming, quote-unquote, unnatural predilection for stone and concrete. Conditioned by their genes, by the genes of their cliff-dwelling and ground-feeding ancestors, and by selective breeding, they do not even retreat to sewers, trees, or parks to defecate, mate, and live, as do so many other animals. Further, these birds may evoke discomfort or even nausea by scavenging humanity's refuse. Their metaphorical quote-unquote pollution of city streets becomes crystallized through their link to humanity's literal pollution, trash. Part of our aversion to pigeons then stems from cultural insecurities about proximity to dirt and impurity. And a little further, Pigeons have lived and scavenged in cities for centuries, but over time, an increasing number of urban spaces have been redefined as off-limits to them, often marked by plastic spikes and by the words, do not feed the pigeons. Columbia Liva is now a quote-unquote homeless species, surviving in the urban interstices off of society's occasional generosity and its refuse. As if the link to their human analogs were not clear enough, Public discourse in the media are filled with references to pigeons as "quote unquote" bums and "quote unquote" squatters. Excellent, thank you so much. I, I love how the quote ties in with, um, you know, we, we've kind of kind of hinted at it throughout: food, waste, living, the, the discomfort that pigeons are able to. And this, I think, is often how animals become problematized in the cities. They they eat things that we don't find pleasant you see a dog decide to eat goose poo and you're like oh why um or you you know just seeing their poo is somehow offensive you know we've kind of like disavowed we don't poo come on humans don't poo um (laughs) but we've kind of disavowed all of these parts of of ourselves where we do them in complete privacy and you know you go to a dog park and you see dogs decide to mount one another people either laugh at it or they they desperately try to stop it because things like poo and sex are just not supposed to be seen and I guess animals do it and they do it unashamedly in spaces and um yeah and that raises a whole bunch of interesting questions about I mean I guess this is maybe a bit off from the the pervasive captivity but or maybe it's not maybe this is how how we're captive to our own social <laughs> our own social things about where we can and cannot do things but a really fascinating quote especially i think waste i don't know if you've done anything with with waste and kind of the the significance of of that in in feeding urban animals no you haven't explored that at all that's really no, interesting i mean i mentioned in passing the fact that many of the urban animals are craving for and become dependent on our sort of unwilling provision or indirect provision of food to them through waste. But uh, mm-hmm. I remember seeing an image, um, gosh, I can't, I think it was in Alaska somewhere um, of a dumpster. It was a massive dumpster. Um, it was open and there was the bald eagle sitting on this dumpster eating eating waste. And obviously that's not the image of the US that the US would like the bald eagle to be. Um, and, and You're a scavenger. Kind of, yeah, it, it, the, the, the eagle was eating and um, was probably eating fairly well from the dumpster, yet that image kind of evoked a whole bunch of emotions from animals because here we're not just speaking about an animal eating waste that's discomforting, but you're speaking about a national symbol, right? The, the, the animal here... So there's there's just a lot of I think interesting juxtapositions about what we expect from ourselves and how we impose it on animals, uh, and maybe because these urban animals are so we're in close proximity to urban animals in a way that we're maybe not in close proximity to other other um, what we were talking about earlier charismatic species that we can't romanticize we, them in the same way. They are actually so close that we don't really notice them. I think that's mm. that's one. Of the- Paradox. One of the earlier titles of the paper, uh, Pervasive Captivity and Urban Wildlife, the earlier title was Hidden in Plain Sight. Because we, we don't notice them, but they're just there for us to see, right? Mm-hmm. The pigeons and all the rats and the squirrels. And people don't really mind them 
um, but also don't really pay attention to them or care for them or admire them, although mm -hmm. they're as admirable as, as all of the charismatic species, I think. I mean, they're amazing. If ever you've watched a squirrel with their little hands figure out the nut they're holding and then watch them in a garden plant the, the nuts in a variety of different places. I saw I saw a squirrel and a crow like battling it off <laughs> because the squirrels were charging at the crows and the crows just seemed completely unfazed. They would fly away a little while and then they would hop back up. And it was quite clear to me that the squirrels were trying to tell the crows to, you know, bugger off because they were trying to plant their, hide their stash and the, the crows were very cleverly uh, watching them. Um, so, I mean, there's so much to watch and see and be in awe of, but I agree with you. We're Oftentimes they're invisible to us until we see them eating poop or pooping. And then, yeah. um, which I think is something Gerald Mack gets at as well, is kind of as soon as they become problems, they become visible, right, which is right. kind of sad a little bit, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, we, we, we see their agency just when their agency conflicts with our interest of mm -hmm. rather than seeing their agency for its own sake right just like as something they do and and so eating poop is just an expression of their agency regardless yeah. of whether it interferes with our interest and stuff. yeah and it's also just part of ecology i guess um and yeah. it's something we need to get a little bit more comfortable with is poop and life are kind of together uh, yeah and we should be glad that they're actually recycling our waste so i think this was a, a bit of a you know in early earlier cities when pigs and earlier earlier cities in the global north when you know pigs and dogs and kind of their free roaming status was um challenged i don't think it was quite obvious how much of the waste management they were doing and then all of a sudden there was more trash in the streets that needed to be sorted and figured out uh, yeah. which is kind of an interesting phenomenon to think through anyway I, I I love talking about this. Thank you so much for all of your insights today. Uh, perhaps before you go, could you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and if folks are interested in the type of work you do where they could get in touch with you? Right, yes. So I'm always working on a bunch of different things at the same time. Um, so I'm currently working mostly uh, on a book project, which is still in its in infancy, um, about the moral community uh, conceived of relationally and how in that relational conception of the moral community, which is the moral community of persons, we can and should uh, integrate at least some species of animals. Mm -hmm. um, so the project seeks to describe the various ways in which animals are persons, starting with animals as agents, which bears on some of the things we've been talking about, um, but also animals as companions, animals as workers, uh, animals as urban residents, and so on and so forth. So I'm going through all the various categories in which we actually are or should recognize the sort of personhood of which uh, non-human mm -hmm. animals are are capable. So is this going beyond kind of that legal concept of personhood, but rather the ways in More which they than... enact personhood? So, yeah, the moral concept of personhood, which might have legal implications, um, mm -hmm. but but moral personhood in the sense of um, that we use when we describe human persons as autonomous, rational, self-conscious agents. Okay. Instead of that conception, I want to work with a conception of persons as members of a moral community that relate to each other in ways in which they can wrong each other. Um, right. Cool. So that's that's the teaser. Very, that's very exciting. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, and so people it. can find some of my work, most of my work actually, um, at uh, nicoladelon.com. So N I C O L A S D E L O N.com. And I post there uh, many preprints of my papers, or they can just find my email there and email if they can't find the paper. Um, Great. And, and they can also find <laughs> syllabi of my courses there. And I'm uh, on Twitter at, at uh, Nico Delon, N I C O D E L O N. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's been great connecting with you here. And, it's been uh, lots of I, fun. Yeah, it's. I, I hope to uh, have you on again. I love, like I said at the beginning, I love speaking to philosophers because I feel even when I ask a dumb question, somehow philosophers are like, hmm, that's interesting. And then you guys see something which is just, uh, um, which is just great. I, yeah, I really um, thank you so much for being on here and for, for yeah, like taking us this concept of pervasive captivity, I'd never thought of it this way in relation to 
the urban. Um, I, I don't think I'd even thought about captivity at all in relation to the urban, which is maybe um, simple minded. But thank you so much. You've really helped me think through this a whole bunch today. My so pleasure. Have a lovely, very lovely few, day. Very few questions are ever dumb, but yours were definitely not. So <laughs> <don't worry about laughs> thank that. you. They were actually really on spot on questions. <laughs> oh, thank you. Again, I've said this before. This is why I do this podcast, because it's really good for my ego. <laughs> That's <laughs> no, a great podcast. Thank you for the work you're doing. And thanks for having me. In this animal highlight, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about an animal who came up in today's episode, and that's the trusty pigeon. Pigeons are absolutely amazing birds. I mean, I knew I really liked pigeons even prior to getting things ready for this animal highlight, but I had no idea how cool they were. I mean, really, there are pigeons who are decorated war heroes and have stories, I mean, military stories and honing stories and a variety of stories about how they've helped and served humans. But as an animal in and of themselves, they are just amazing. They can see in ultraviolet light. They can hear ultrasound. They're one of only a few species that produce something called crop milk, which is where pre-digested food is regurgitated through the lining of their throat. And it's a, it's a really uh, rich milk that's high in fat and protein. They live in cities in abundance, even though humans have actively tried to remove them from cities. And one of the reasons they really like cities is because there's a whole host of food available, but also our buildings tend to look a lot like cliff faces. They're amazing flyers. They're able to find their way home from almost anywhere. So pigeons are just awesome. They were domesticated by humans some 5,000 years ago. And what you might not know, pigeons can live for between 3 to 15 years. So when you see a pigeon on the street pecking away, you might want to stop to think about how old this pigeon is and the world they've seen and the things they've done. Okay, and one more really cool thing for an animal highlight is pigeons are thought to have really high conceptual capacities. So a lot of people have heard about the mirror test and elephants and chimpanzees passing what's the mirror test. Pigeons have passed this test. Other studies have also been done in trying to understand or unpack pigeons' conceptual capacities. So in one, they were shown a variety of different paintings to try and see if they could distinguish between Monet and Picasso paintings. And once they had started to identify the difference between Monet and Picasso paintings, they started to be able to differentiate between different paintings based on style. So when they were shown a painting that they had never ever seen before, if that style resembled Picasso, they were able to show that's a Picasso painting. And with the same kind of conceptual reasoning, they've realized that pigeons are also able to identify malignant versus benign cancer when looking at a scan. So they'll have a scan of both malignant and benign cancer tumors. And a single pigeon is able to do this once trained to identify and differentiate between the two, is able to identify the difference 85% of the time. But when you put them in a group of pigeons, they're able to do so 99% of the time, which is just an amazing fact. They can see colors and they tend to mate for life, which means they pick someone who they like, they like and they love, and they stick with them, which is rather amazing. So I've thrown a whole host of facts at you today about pigeons and how great their vision is and their hearing and their ability to find their way home. Uh, but all I really want to do is say, the next time you see a pigeon in your city, stop, look at them, consider how old they are, consider what their relationships are, how many young they've given milk to. They really are amazing, amazing birds who we've got thousands and thousands of years worth of history with. So I hope that you stop and you watch pigeons. I want to say a huge thank you to Nicola Delon for joining me as a guest today. Uh, thank you as always to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. Oh. Uh.
For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah.